OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining. We're from Grossman Adult Education, and we're just going over our uh, site plan. Um, we're on uh, the, D the DLAC Academy uh, with O-Town, that's Digital Leadership Academy. And so we're sharing with you what we have so far and, uh, and what we're moving towards. I'm Nikki, I'm our Program Specialist for Grossman Adult Ed. I'm Jenna, I'm our Distance Learning Teacher. I'm Barbara Van Dyke, and I am an ESL teacher and a digital literacy integration specialist. And I am Jennifer Owens, the ESL director. And um, if we could just kind of hear from our group today, where everybody's from. Keep it from Sacramento. Okay. Uh, Oakland. All right. Great. You're welcome. Salinas, but I might be in the wrong room, so I'm double checking. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sacramento. Okay. Down from Ventura. Okay. San Diego, Fresno. All right. Welcome. Well, thanks everybody for Wait, coming. You're from this guy right here. He's San Diego. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and um, for everybody on Zoom, welcome as well. Um. So, uh, we just wanted to start with a little bit about our site plan. Um, in designing our site plan. We knew a few things already, and then we've learned uh, several things over the last few months. Um, so because of the team that we have, um, we, we decided to focus mainly on our ESL program and then uh, kind of keep an eye for what could be a template for um, technology integration and considerations um, across other programs. Um, we do have a, a pretty impacted ESL program right now. Um, mainly in three areas. So in our entry point, uh, when students come in for orientation, um, in our zero to one or literacy levels, and then also in our intermediate advanced levels. Um, we also have limited space. So we have to work with the facilities that we have. So um, uh, utilizing our, our leadership to, to think about new ways that we could expand what we have. Uh, to account for uh, hybrid and high flex, flex options that we don't currently offer, and then also uh, share facilities with programs um, that um, maybe are underutilized right now. Um, we also have limited staff, so uh, we need to max out what our teachers' strengths are and, uh, and consider their availability. And then um, in all of that, though, still um, keeping a student-centered focus on uh, college and career goals for where our students want to want to go. Um, so we we also know, and I think know more and more that we need to understand that this plan is going to impact other programs because we're asking them to accommodate us, share students with us, and um, we need to collaborate with them um, so that we can, um, uh, you know, work with CTE, work with high school programs. Uh, for our language learners and in um, implementing IET. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to Barbara. To... <laughs> okay, so we've got them. Look, we have a whole list of them right here. We're, we want to identify our learners' uh, prior knowledge and skills. We want to know what they know about technology, whether that be uh, you know to operate their uh, their iPhone or smartphone. Or you know if they're familiar with iPads or, or computers, so we, we really want to ascertain where they are in their prior knowledge of computers. Um, we are also looking at developing their digital literacy skills, and um, and those are uh, linked to our Grossman Adult Education Technology Outcomes. And we want to do this by integrating uh, language learning because in our ESL program, many of the students are um, they're just learning English. And so well, the ideal is to get them on programs on the computer where they're actually uh, improving, you know, they're apps that are helping them to improve their language learning. So, uh, so that's another thing we're looking at. We're looking at um, what the learner um, access 
to materials, access to uh, technology. You know, if students don't have access, we want to know about it and we want to help them to make the connection so that they have the tools that they need to access online resources. Um, and we want to do this in an environment or in a community that, it, that cultivates continual uh, improvement. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, uh, be sure to uh, have regular assessments of how the students are doing. Are they actually learning from this particular app? What, you know, how, how are the improvements in their language learning? And um, and in and all of this in a very supportive learning environment or, or community. And Jen, hi. So these are some of our learners, some pictures of our learners. A lot of these are distance learning students, our distance learning students that graduated from the program. They're holding the most certificates. Um, as you can see, we serve a large population of students with from all over the world. Um, over the years, we've had different influxes of refugees come in. Um, when I first started, it was all Hispanic, 100%. And then I remember we had a huge Russian influx of refugees come in. Um, it sounds like 2015, but right now we serve primarily um, Afghanistan, students from Afghanistan and Iraq and Hispanic. Jennifer's going to go over the demographics a little bit more later. Um, but our students are from all walks of life, all over the world, all ages, um, like a lot of your students are, I'm sure. Um, and their goals are varied. Some, are, they just want to learn how to use a computer and digital literacy. Uh, some want citizenship, uh, workforce readiness, college and career, language acquisition, community. So they have varied goals. And um, uh, yes, so there we go. And then I have a video. So these are some videos of some students that um, are talking about why distance education is important to them. We're not going to play all of them, but go ahead and hear from one of our students. Hi, my name is Iftikhar Zarini. Uh, I am from the United States. This class helped me a lot because I can practice my uh, lessons every day. I request my teacher to send me a uh, lesson that I want and make my own study schedule. And I can do it from home. Uh, uh, I like distant learning course because I have children. I have a very busy life based off my uh, normal schedule. I can make my own uh, schedule to do my homework. Thank you very much, my teacher. God bless you. Bye. <laughs> so currently our distance learning students, we do have the special circumstance students that really need it because they do work full time or they're on call or they have health issues or they're taking care of someone or they have young children or babies where they can't attend in-person classes. And then we have our distance learning students who um, they want extra homework, they want extra lessons. So they're attending classes in person as well and doing both. So it's more of like a support. And I get a lot of teachers um, contacting me saying, this student, you know, they need this, this, and that. So I can give them lessons that will help them achieve their goals, specific lessons that are tailored to what they need. Nice. So we would like to, can we do some more? Oh, sure. We debated. I was just going to put one because they only have a limited amount of time. And I'm like, um, is there one in particular that you would like to? <laughs> This one, Jenna. Pretty short. Um, okay. <laughs> She's, she's been with me for a while. Hi, my name is Behisht Hafizi. I'm originally from Afghanistan. I came to the U.S. since 2017. I have been to this learning class since 2019 with teacher Jennifer. This class helped me to improve my English. Also, this class helped me to uh, how to use the computer also i like this learning distance learning class because in the same time while i'm doing my homework i can watch my children too and this class is 
very helpful and uh, I want to continue this class until I get my like a certificate or something from my teacher also, Bethy is so shy this was so hard for her and um and you know she was super shy and embarrassed but when I explained to them what it was for and that it helps them and helps our school and helps other students they all went for it it was really cool so do you want to hear one more yeah. is a short one okay Hilda's is really short <laughs> Hi, my name is Hilda Corral. I am from San Diego, U.S. I like distance learning online studying because I work full time in my education. She's actually a caregiver that works full time. And she works like 60 hour a week. So, and she's killing it in distance learning. I mean, she's doing lessons every day. Like, it's incredible. But, so those are some of our learners. We have quite a few. These are some of the standout ones. These are like extra good students for distance learning, but I will give it to Jeff right now. Thank you. So this is just a quick snapshot, um, just one particular demographic of our students. We just kind of selected out the most frequent student languages. So this kind of gives you an idea of the students we serve. We have 36.8% are native Arabic speakers, 35.4% Spanish, 10.5% Farsi, and 3.5% Pashto, then the other 13.5% are the others all combined. Uh, we do have translators in our program. We have one translator that speaks both Farsi and Pashto, and we have a Spanish translator, and we're in search of an Arabic translator. This isn't a job posting announcement, just that we're in the process of doing that. <laughs> so we have, um, since July 1st, we've uh, enrolled 2,133 students wow. Wow. in our program. So I don't want to throw that. Up. It's just four. Oh, okay. Um, and then here again, it's just the same uh, information on the chart for accessibility. <clears throat> and this, when we started this, I kind of just took the <laughs> tech survey that we all give our students. Everybody familiar with? One I'm talking about, the one that comes out annually. And I just went through and I sorted through and found the ESL responses. And I was just looking as we're going forward, planning for different types of options for students. Where are students at? What do they have? And I think some of these are important factors. And as we're going forward and doing our planning, um, one of the ones I found really interesting was 20% of our students said in the survey do not have a quiet place to study. So at some of our centers, we have incorporated a student center, and we're in the process of creating one at our ESL campus. And so this could just be a place where students have to go if they don't have a quiet place at home. 71% um, of students said they do not have a device to study online. So as we're going forward to this is an important, whether it's identifying what the devices they need, but these are um, questions and issues that we need to address going forward. And 13% of the students said they do not have Wi-Fi or internet at home. Again, another important factor if we're creating a digital and a distance learning program with various components, these are important pieces of information to take into consideration as we move forward. Okay. Okay, so as far as uh, recruitment goes, um, you know, getting the word out is definitely a challenge, I think, because our programs can tend to be siloed. I don't know if anybody else experiences that at their school. And so, um, you know, if we have a, um, a CTE program with language support um, that we're calling IET, um, and someone comes in and they're advanced to our ESL program, they may not, they may not hear about it uh, when they reach the front counter. And uh, same goes for a uh, high school completion program or our transitions to college. So uh, so we know that as far as recruitment goes, we, we need to make sure that, um, that the word goes out across programs and that we continue to find new ways um, to do that. And I do think uh, being part of DLAC and 
and having a team that includes our teachers and our ESL director is going to be one big piece of, of making that happen going forward. Um, uh, we are looking to, uh, I think, um, really focus on our beginning high ESL students and up. Uh, when we're looking at um, creating uh, high flex and uh, or hybrid and uh, high flex classes um, so that those students could um, uh, participate in those. We'd have a chance to work on uh, their digital literacy. And then um, really our lower level students could be in person, but with continuous technology support in our lab. Um, most teachers are taking their students to the lab to work on technology every single week. So we're really hoping that those students would be more and more prepared as they move up through uh, beginning high and above to be in uh, some of our um, hybrid classes. We do currently, and Barbara will talk about it in a little bit, have a beginning low to high hybrid class. Um, so we do wanna make that available to the lower levels, but we also wanna be really aware of um, what's working at other schools and what's working for our students at the at the very beginning of their language learning. Um, and then uh, we also want to make sure that our students who are able to go into our CTE classes with language support have the digital literacy that they need to be successful in those classes, because a lot of times those classes don't stop to uh, to support them. So um, we're also um, starting some some new classes that will be kind of free classes like uh, foundational classes and um, computer basics and then be more intentional about our digital literacy pieces in our uh, vocational ESL classes so that students uh, get a, a stronger preparation piece at that level. Um, oh, and I, I wanted to make sure that I talked about uh, working with transition services. So uh, we do have a very strong transition services um, program at our school. So we have a transition specialist that's focused in, um, in each program we offer, but also that can work across programs. So, um, so making sure that transition services knows about all of the classes that are available and that we really collaborate with them to make sure that students don't really see that they see a seamless process of support to get into the classes that they need. And then orientation and assessing readiness. So, um, you know, we have an ESL introduction class. It's two weeks. Uh, right now, we're also taking a look at some of our programs that have successful orientation, specifically our Health Occupation Center. You know, they have like a two-day orientation process. We're looking at, could that be a better fit for our more advanced students than spending, you know, two weeks in, um, in an introduction class? Would that get them into a, their class faster? Would that get them into an IET class faster? So um, we're working with the two-week introduction class, but also looking at other models that might be a better fit, especially as we're bridging uh, our ESL students into other programs. Um, uh, currently in our ESL intro, we offer, or we do um, take care of the, the CASAS assessment. And then we also wanna make sure that we have a digital literacy assessment going on um, in the introduction so that we can find out right away what students can do and, and if they'd be interested in a hybrid class. And, um, and then it's, uh, you know, really key that they're meeting with their teacher, that they're meeting with transition services, and that we know um, what does their prior learning look like? What is everything that they're bringing to the table so that we're uh, honoring what they've done before and maximizing it so that they could go into the right path? Okay. And um, yes, so uh, registration and accessibility. So the idea is that we're designing a, ideally we're designing a student-centered process so we're working towards uh, students being able to register online as well as in person. And, um, and that I think that'll streamline, or we think that that'll uh, streamline things a little bit better for our students. 
Also incorporating in our orientation, a digital literacy diagnostic score that will assess their readiness for uh, digital uh, uh, distance, education. distance education and blended learning or yeah, be, sorry. Yeah. Okay, those are my <laughs> all right, those are yours. Okay, and if they don't meet the requirements, uh, we're we're going to look for ways to help them to get there. Uh, we'll take a look at a prerequisite for uh, the classes for students that are interested in distance learning and, and blended options um, that maybe they are not ready yet. And um, next one here. Yeah. And it's you. Okay. All right. So hybrid classes. I teach a hybrid class right now with um, beginning low uh, to high students, and we meet twice a week on Zoom and twice a week in the classroom. Right now, we are so fortunate to be meeting in the computer lab at our Foothills uh, site. And by the way, my my uh, director and you know my uh, my hierarchy here. I want you to know that those students, they love working on the computers because going into that lab twice a week and getting on the computer, most of them don't have that much experience turning on a computer or accessing resources using a, a bigger format. The, the, the biggest format they have is, you know, a, a smartphone. And so for them to get onto a bigger, you know, uh, a bigger monitor, it is uh, liberating for them. They, they get to see for the first time, you know, what this learning looks like in a bigger uh, frame, so to speak. And so one of the, the main things where we're headed with the hybrid classes is communication. Communication is really the key keeping contact with them either through email or in Canvas. All of these students are enrolled in Canvas and they're required to complete a certain amount of work in Canvas to become oriented towards that learning environment. Most of them are accessing Canvas on the phone. So they're seeing a teeny tiny little Canvas, but when they get into the, the, uh, the computer lab, Canvas becomes bigger and it gets a little bit easier for them to understand how to move through the program. So in Canvas, there are wonderful tools. There's announcements, there's email. There are things you can time them. And these are ways to keep the communication going with them consistently, you know, every day or not every day, but a couple times a week at least. And, you know, when I send them a video, through Canvas, that it lights up their life, you know, their lives, you know, they, you know, they, oh, here, teacher Barbara, she's, she's in my living room with me, you know, <laughs> so, you know, this communication is really, really important, and, you know, um, it, you know, it's a crucial aspect, teaching strategies, so, you know, when we have these classes, we really need to figure out how are we going to teach in this online environment? How do we take what we do in the classroom, which you know we may be experts at a live classroom, and put that in the environment of, say, Canvas or on Zoom? And some uh, teaching strategies I have are uh, using, um, uh, you know, I use a, uh, a Google slide presentation with every Zoom. And that keeps us on track. That's basically our, our, our uh, lesson plan in, in, you know, in Zoom. Uh, embedded support. And what we mean by that is supporting students and teachers in learning Canvas, in learning you know, how, you know, what this educational environment looks like. Teaching teachers how to teach in an online environment. And uh, progress, um, always, you know, we need to measure our progress, what's working, what isn't working, and then assessment. And um, who's next? <laughs> I don't know, we'll have the next slide too. Okay. Yes. I'd love to hear what you're doing with Canvas, so yay. Good for you. Um, uh, but I also wanted to ask what you're using for your digital um, diagnostic, digital literacy diagnostic. 
Uh, well, uh, the digital digital literacy diagnostic is it's a basically a survey, um, and um, I have it both in you know the doc form where they fill it they can fill it out online. I can print them out. They can fill them out in the classroom. Uh, that's probably the best place you know to kind of hold their hand through it, especially the students that are uh, beginning low and beginning high. And uh, just find out what they know and don't know. And, and their questions on there are, you know, I can turn on a computer. Mm -hmm. I can hold a mouse. I know what click on it means. I know, you know, and it goes, it gets, the questions get, there's like, I think, 32 questions. It's a little long. <laughs> but they, they get, a, you know, a little more difficult. You know, they're the more difficult tasks as you go down the page. And Barbara, you developed it when you were teaching the digital literacy class, yeah. right? But there's, and there's also one that you've utilized through North Star. Is that accurate? Because um, North Star has one too, I think. Yeah. 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 And some of your students, I think, have. Yeah, yeah, so, but the, my main go-to is that, I mean, you can tell when you work with them online, you can kind of get an idea of what they know and don't know when you get with them in the classroom. Some of them cannot hold a mouse, you know, some of them can't click on the trackpad, you know, and it's because many of our students, you know, they're, they're, what's familiar to them is, you know, rural Afghanistan. You know, where chew, maybe the closest thing to chewing gum might be, um, you know, for a, a sore tooth or something, might be a, an herb, you know, that they're, you know, this is so foreign to them. And so yeah, you can find out right away who is struggling and who isn't, and then you can figure out how, how to, to support them in um, their digital literacy yeah. and becoming literate in, in this environment. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, good. <laughs> Dear Hunter. Yeah. So one of the reasons why we joined DLAB and started this adventure, one of the many reasons, is to find a compatible resource for distance education with our LMS, which is Canvas. Um, this is a lot of language up here, but something that meets a lot of these needs, finding an online curriculum for various levels, because in distance learning, we serve various levels, the multi-level class. It's also a very large class. I mean, I've honestly, I've had up to 250 students. Wow. Um, that was when I had 10 offsites that I was visiting. So a lot of the students were dual enrolled, but on average, there's probably over a hundred, about 140. Yeah, so it's a, it's a large class with um, a multi-level class. And currently, each student has an individual class. I'm trying to help them reach their goals. So they're getting individual lessons and they're all different levels. So it's a little bit challenging and hard to keep up with. At the same time, I'm searching, we're searching for something that is compatible with our LMS as well, which is Canvas, which is awesome. But to serve the needs of the students currently and how it's Mm -hmm. um, structured, it's a challenge, and that's kind of us, one of the reasons why we're here. Um, yeah, so finding an online curriculum for various levels, meeting various student goals in a large class, um, tailoring and modifying lessons. I already talked about a lot of this. Um, right now, I do have a website that I use, um, and it has a calendar on there where students can make appointments with me, so I'm accessible to them. Um, and I'd have a little QR code, which is blocked, I think. So I don't know if it's, <laughs> I don't know if you can actually open it. But on there, there's a lot of um, online educational resources, OERs. I have a whole page of them that you guys are welcome to look at that I've put together over the years that actually we've all compiled over the years. And I've checked all of them, so they're all current. <laughs> it's a very, very long list, but it's, um, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I use a lot of supplemental materials. Um, I have a digital, literacy assessment that I give them um, that's online that they can do too. Um, but yeah, curriculum that's user-friendly and geared towards adults is also a little bit difficult to find, as you guys know, um, as ESL teachers, and uh, can be monitored by the instructor anytime, anywhere, it's accessible to the student on any device. Um, like Barbara was saying, a lot of them are using the phones, so you need something that's compatible with that. Um, so, 
if you'd like to look at my website or anything, you can go ahead and click on the QR. I don't know if it, can anyone try that? Open. It opened up. Okay, cool. Oh, cool. Oh, oh, so, what have you found for advancement students besides Burlington English for ESL? Currently, I'm using Ellie, which is ESL Library, the digital component of Ellie, um, as one of my main platforms. Um, also, Reading Plus and uh, touched on Burlington a little bit and North Star. So, what was it reading what? Reading Plus. Yeah. Students, that's a higher level um, program. It's usually geared for the higher levels, but they enjoy that one quite a bit. Are there any more questions? Oh, I did have a question. Um, about how long does a student stay with you? Can they continue semester to semester? They can. I mean, sometimes, you know, with any of our students, you have to kind of push them along a little bit. Um, Bahishta, the really shy girl, she's been with me for quite a while. And, you know, when the, when it seems like it's like when they're ready to move on, I kind of meet with them and help push them to go towards their goals. You know, like it's it's time to... To go. I mean, I think we all deal with that as adult ed teachers. They want to stay with you sometimes a little bit longer than they should, actually. But um, on average, I would say probably a year, depending on where they're at when they start with me. Um, a lot of them are uh, they're pretty high in their English and their capabilities, so they're you know they're going to get a job sooner and get their citizenship sooner and reach those goals sooner, and then probably leave some of them if they're a little bit lower when they start with me. They're with me a little bit longer. Obviously, if they're in our in-person classes and with business learning, they're going to move a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So just end. Okay. So how do you utilize um, Canvas for independent studies and keep, keeping track of your individualized conversations that you have? That's, see, that's the struggle with me right now. Barbara would... Yeah. We're in the pre days yeah. for yeah. now, yeah. so we're trying to move yeah, into that's Canvas for yeah. distance learning. We yes. haven't yet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Barbara would be able to answer that yeah. better than I would. If... So what was the question one more time? So how do you utilize Canvas to keep track of the individual meetings that you have for independent study students? Well, what I do is I go in and under people, are you, okay. are you familiar with Canvas? Yes, yes. Okay, so you go to people, you can take a look and see how much time they've been spending on each task. Okay. And um, and that's pretty much the way that, that I'm doing it. Okay. And um, and you know, seeing where they're spending their time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, if so I want to pitch them assignments underneath there, you have assignments that you do, and then you can see their assignments when you go to people. Yes, yes, but like, much of what I'm doing, like individual conversations. Yeah, she's like, How do you track individual conversations? Do you have oh, a, yes. Jim, right. do you have a suggestion? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He might, this is our LMS coordinator. Do you have a suggestion for tracking notes? Like, would you put it under an assignment or a submission, maybe? Link it to Excel or... You could, you could, I mean, it, it, would, it would be probably a function of, like, teacher feedback on an assignment. So you could create an assignment or whatever, oh, and then you could, assignment. you could, sorry? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think you could, I think you could do something like that with teacher, with, with the, the speed grader function, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, when it comes to Canvas... I'm so I feel like a neophyte, you know, even though I know how to put things up there and I know how to look and see what they're doing, right. there is so much that I'm not tapping into yet. And right. so you it really drives home the point of getting as much training as you can in it so you can really master the medium. So I think I'm like, you probably know way more than I do about it, you know, but this is why it's important for us to get together and talk about these things and right. show each other the nifty little tricks. Did you have a- Yeah, you know what? There, well, there, there is a user manual for Canvas and mm -hmm. the PDF file is 668 pages long. Yeah. There you go. So that is information overload. It is so huge. Yeah. It, yes. Uh, could, could, uh, what, as you listed resources, um, you mentioned something called Ellie. Can you spell that out, or is it is it? That's the old ESL library. Yeah. It's, ESL library. E L L I I. Okay. They did a name change recently, and that's an excellent resource. Yeah. It is just it's. You know, they've got so much there. The digital component is is really good for remote learning. Yeah, it just needs to be compatible with Canvas. <laughs> yeah.
Maybe yeah. soon, maybe in the future. Okay, so yeah. keep moving on here. And so, and so that kind of brings us to where we are with our distance learning program. So, you know, we just had our watch review last year and something I think for, for most of our ESL program, including the distance learning component is they're really looking for alignment. Um, and so uh, currently we're using ESL library, um, but we really need to have some sort of, of mapping of, of what it looks like in a level so that if a student is beginning high in our distance learning program, they would have something that aligned with our in-person classes. Um, so if we, if we uh, stick with ESL library, then we would need to kind of uh, have something uh, documented of how a student would move through the program and uh, what that might take different branches, but right now it's not aligned with our, our uh, other ESL classes. Um, something like Burlington, um, uh, I worked with many years ago uh, for vocational ESL, but we had a recent presentation and they have, you know, um, core courses that are NRS aligned and would be pretty easy for us to align with our current ESL classes. So that might be something that makes a little bit more sense for us um, as we try to align our distance learning program. And we um, already have Burlington seats that might work nicely with the number of students that we have on our, on our DL caseload. Um, currently, um, and, and you know, when we met with Burlington, um, like their, their EL Civics is not Canvas compatible, but uh, I guess their core is more Canvas compatible or closer, but it still seems like we would need to embed a link and take a student away from the Canvas page, which is what we're hoping not to do. So, um, so you know, we're looking at that. And then as far as North Star goes, that's also something that we use. And um, we really want to look at how can we align the digital literacy aspects of North Star uh, alongside our ESL curriculum. So then we could kind of put that alongside in person as well as distance learning classes for that D, uh, DL component. Um, we have this year um, had uh, our ESL programs have been working through PLCs on a program ride pacing guide to align our ESL levels. Um, so that's a work in progress, but they've been able to kind of, um, you know, show timeframes, show competencies, um, identify objectives, and then, um, and then really uh, hopefully get closer to a project-based focus where they have activities that are, that are our primary assessments. And then we're not really believing that our book is a curriculum, that's really just a tool towards mastering those competencies. So, so that's something that we, we hope ultimately we could find something for DL that matches up with the work that we're trying to do for our, for our in-person ESL. All right, program materials. Oh, yeah, um, program uh, measurables. Yeah, okay, surprise. <laughs> All right, so improve digital literacy skills. This is something that we can measure. We can say, okay, this is where they are now. And then three months from now, six months from now, it's probably maybe four months, you know. Um, you know, we can measure it and see how they're doing. Uh, and we can also measure their language proficiency from today, you know, three months from now after using a, a particular program. Um, and we can also, because we've got the computer and you know we're in a digital environment, we can, it's very easy to measure these things. You can see how much time they're spending on a task, what they're doing, and, um, and you know, if they are, you know, if they're engaging or if they're just laying on the couch. Um, positive feedback from learners. Do you like this? Yes, teacher, yes. No, teacher, no. I don't know, teacher. So positive feedback, reduced barriers to learner learning. Are they able to access the information? Are we taking away those barriers that are keeping them from getting to the uh, 
the curriculum that we're offering them in the online environment. Um, we're looking for consistent participation. And so we're questioning what is it that we have to do to ensure that they are online regularly. And then um, another uh, uh, measurable would be, you know, how many students are completing the program? You know, how many are getting uh, a certificate? How many are moving up in a, maybe uh, from low beginner to high beginner? You know, how many are, are moving up that way? And was there anything you wanted to add? No, okay, great, all right, great, okay. So this slide's called Administrative Issues, and I have to say that um, my objective and my goal always is to be a support in whatever way I can to um, such amazing teachers. I don't know if, when I say that working with them is an absolute pleasure, they're all very genuine, and what you see is what you get, and students are always at the forefront. And as an administrator, that makes my job so much easier because they're they're genuine in what they do. They care about the students. They go above and beyond. And yeah, I mean, it, it is just such a pleasure. So one of the things that um, when I start, and I've only been in my job since June 1st, so I still say that I'm new. I get to say that for like a year, right? <laughs> okay. So one of the things that only six months? Yeah. Oh shoot. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that we tried as a pilot in um, July is that first bullet you see there. We are trying to expand not only student use of Canvas, but teacher use of Canvas. And I know for myself, I mean I taught in academics for 15 years and we had a new administrator come in and say, back to that digital literacy. And I'm like, wow, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so when I started my job, I thought I want to create what I wanted when I was a teacher, which is someone like Barbara who co-teaches with me at least a day. So what would ha what happened that has been happening is um, classes come into the computer lab, like she said, like this. And I made up a title for her. She didn't get a pay raise or anything fancy oh, with yeah. it, but it's we call coming. Oh, it's coming. Uh, she's our digital literacy integration specialist, which is totally made up and not by any means legit, except for that, the fact. <laughs> <laughs> except for that, the fact that um, it, the the six months that we've been doing this, not only has uh, Barbie teach a digital literacy class where she would you know serve twenty students, and I said, why can't we? expand that out and rather than just 20 year meeting with 150 students a week and so yeah Barbara works with the teacher she they have built um or improved canvas courses for most of the teachers that she's worked with so not only are students going in and learning canvas and how to use it but the teachers are yeah. simultaneously and I think a lot of teachers were canvas shy um we kind of you know, we still are. Okay. Yeah. We're getting better. Mm -hmm. um, I think in COVID, we all kind of scrambled to survive. And you know that term, but you know, we build the plane as we're flying it. So it's been my uh, priority to make sure we build the plane first before we start flying. And participating in VLAC has afforded us the opportunity to really examine that look at what we need, look at what our students need, look at the resources we have, and how can we build this plane, get things set up, and then kind of roll it out so that teachers are comfortable, teachers know are, know what's going on, so that they can help students better. I think it's just, in my opinion, the best way. Um, oh, I look and I skipped right to bullet number two all of a sudden. So again, that's this core right here. Um, we have some teachers, like Barbara said, not everybody's into all of the digital technology and all that. But I think the key is letting them spread the gospel of digital integration and digital literacy and how to use technology in a way that helps students and helps teachers at the same time. So our strategy is to start with our, our core group and just let it you know organically spread out, which I think that it will. 
And I think it has even just doing the integration specialist mm -hmm. part, right? <laughs> Um, one last thing too is we, Nick had mentioned at the very beginning, we have limited space. We just had three new buildings added to our site, which is super great. Um, but we still have limited, limited space for how much we have. So we're really looking at having more hybrid options to maximize classroom usage. And um, so part of what we're building now, hopefully rolling out for the fall, I don't think they know that yet, but. Um, and hoping, trying to have more of those hybrid digital um, options where we can have two days in person, two days on Zoom, like, or some kind of synchronous on Canvas or whatever that Barb is doing right now. So administrative issues, my, my job is easy by their professionalism and their knowledge and their, their dedication to our program. So I'm grateful for that. So. Could I ask you one oh, question sure. about this? Uh, Hybrid or the mm. high flex. Mm -hmm. Does the adult education uh, um, permitted to adopt this hybrid and flexible, flexible high flex class? In our organization, yeah, we can. So we you can. belong to COE in doing it because I understood that it's a, we have to be hundred percent face-to-face -face now after the pandemic. So um, yeah. I just want to know. It has to be a I could, I, yeah, it, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I could speak to that a little bit just because that's where I'm living right now. It's just a lot of, I'm doing a lot of advocacy in my district. Um, so pretty much adult education is um, unfettered by the bounds of AB 86, which only uh, applied to the year, academic year, uh, you know, 2021, 2022. So at this point, we're no longer, you know, agencies are no longer bound by that to my knowledge, although you may want to double check, although just based on my research, uh, it really comes down to what your county and your district, you know, what their policies are in regards to, uh, you know, distance learning. I know I had the right, I wrote basically a research article <laughs> to convince my board or my district to open up one section of uh, high flex, which is what I what I teach in the morning. Mm -hmm. So um, it really depends. You have to kind of talk to you know, your district, see what they I, I asked that question because I am really into this technology and use it, but they just let out and told me that we have to be 100% face-to-face -face because the pandemic is over. So what I build at all these things, now it's in the face-to-face. -face. So I'm just curious how you get approval. And so I want to just- And I would say Jenna, Jenna's been doing distance learning for way before COVID. Way before COVID. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think a lot of it is maybe just how it's, um, there's certain, you know, like, Funding guidelines that have to be followed, and I think if you're very specific, but you might want to ask somebody else. I don't know. But I don't know. I'm just curious. I'm yeah. not counting, but I, I know our school is not doesn't support it. Doesn't yes. support it. Yeah, yeah. And we, like I said, we've had a distance learning independent study option for yeah, way did. before yeah. COVID. It's yeah. not just COVID related. It's yeah, no, way even before COVID, yeah. we had it mm -hmm. since the nineties. Um, our, uh, I know your health occupations, our health occupations also has a hybrid option for at least three of their programs. So maybe that one I know because uh, I have to get board approval, Yeah, but it's a school wise, it's not permitted. So I, I don't bother to go get, uh, I mean, I have to get accreditation from California State Board or the nursing department. And then CNA is a CDTH, that's a different one. <laughs> yeah, and the school wise. Yeah, so we belong to the school district. So I like to know if you know the school district get the permission, I would influence definitely. Yeah. I'd like we can, like you know what? We will I'll ask somebody higher up than me. <laughs> and we'll get back. Yeah, we'll give we'll, we can get back to you. We'll, we'll find out. I mean, we can help you with what we <laughs> And it might just be based on whatever the parameters are for the district or the area. <laughs> I yeah. do think it's a district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're referring to COE accreditation, I think that's maybe a separate thing that you'd have to ask the COE. Right. right. COE in you know, Iowa. Uh, is it called Iowa? Oh, are you? Uh, no. Iowa? <laughs> 
same letter. Yes. <laughs> Good point. Well, you can definitely be running distance learning programs. You can be running mm -hmm. hybrid, high flex, all, all, yeah. all of that. Under CAPE, you could do all of that. Yep. Yeah. It's really based on the district decision. Yes. And often the district is focused more on the K 12, and then they're automatically including adult ed. So sometimes you can make the case to do something differently. Sometimes but not. I did go to the conference. They're all encouraging these uh, high flex mm -hmm. and the blended, but then when I come back to ca campus and they were not allowing, so I got like a really it's there's no six Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering well, on how how they got approved, you know, so I can implement it. Yeah, it, it sounds like it's your district. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> your helping with. Um. So we just uh just. Kind of according to our um, our whole site plan outline, um, we did kind of want to share some of our action steps and what the timeline is that we're looking at right now. So this spring, I think um, today's presentation was a marker for us because we wanted to really have kind of a general idea of what we thought was possible for us as far as the site plan goes. Um, we had that uh, additional Burlington meeting. I mean, for us, uh, uh, finding something else that we already had approval for that we could possibly use for alignment for distance learning was big. Um, uh, part of my job is new too as program specialist. So um, working with something uh, within that kind of uh, group of materials that for EL Civics. And that also could be a tool that we use uh, working with our IET students um, was something we wanted to find out how up to date it was. Um, uh, we have uh, new um, bridging classes or classes will be presented um, as a bridge classes and that is kind of a new menu of opportunities for our intermediate advanced students to uh, consider if they hadn't before or hadn't even known about them before um, moving into our ABE classes, high school completion classes, CTE classes with language support. Um, our students are already in those classes, but it's often not presented to an ESL student that just walks in. Um, and then uh, this summer, uh, we really want those new course offerings to be student facing. So that students uh, know about them and are registering for them. Uh, and um, we'd really like to see through our work in DLAC um, how distance learning could um, be a, um, a support for uh, our IET uh, classes. So uh, students coming to us, either they've joined a CTE class and decide they're going to step out and give themselves more time or they decide that they're ready with language support, could we offer uh, uh, steps that they could take to prepare themselves? So uh, just one example, I'm working with a student right now who is in our uh, CNA course. She decided that she wasn't ready. She wanted to step out. So um, she has time for an in-person class, but she also uh, would really benefit from contextualized distance learning which is something within the Burlington modules, especially because we don't have right now a contextualized medical preparation class. Mm -hmm. So so we wanna be able to offer multiple steps for a student to prepare themselves uh, for the CT course they're, they're going to enter. And then training and professional development for our ESL teachers. So this will come through our professional learning days that um, are, um, um, consortium designs with um, our uh, leadership, and um, we have um, uh, Canvas, a time for our teachers to join for one on one meetings, and then professional development uh, through their PLC. So um, we just wanted to uh, also give the last few minutes if. You have any more questions or suggestions for us? Ideas uh, that could help us or that's worked for your schools? 
question. Sure. Um, it was, and the ESL introduction class was mentioned that's two weeks long. Could you go into more detail as far as the hours and what you do in that introduction class? And are they actually registered for that class or it's just prior to registration? So I'll let Barbara and Jen. And the, uh, the orientation is to, uh, before they can take any classes, now, now they come in and they have to take a two week orientation. We want to get a baseline on the CASA score for them. And we also want to introduce them to our campus to, you know, help them to become familiar with the environment that they're in. And it, it's a two week course. Um, and it combines both, uh, well, when I taught it, ESL games, you know, preparation for uh, taking the CASA's test, because that can be very grueling. And for the teacher, you know, kind of um, ascertaining who can actually take the CASAS test and who would go right into uh, a pre-lit class, you know. So we, that that two weeks, we're identifying their levels. Wow. Oh, and is we, it we like 40 days a week, 40 days a week? Is it? So it's um, four days a week. For instance, versus four days a week for two weeks. There are three-hour sections. We offer morning, afternoon, and evening. And um, other components, in addition to what Barbara said, uh, there's uh, writing assessments that take place from the teacher. And then the, the students leave the class with a portfolio of writing samples. So when they get to their assigned class, their new teacher now has not only their reading and listening cost of score, but they have some writing samples as well. Um, they also have digital literacy. They, if they don't have an email account, they, we help the teachers get an email account assigned to them. Uh, we're always kind of looking, that just started in July. And so gone through a couple, you know, iterations. I would say it's just a little bit of like just changing and evolving all the time. We're also introduced to all the programs that uh, Gross Bond Adult Education offers and what's available through our consortium. Our transition specialists come into the class and do a presentation. Our academic counselor comes into the class so the students know that they have the transition support and the academic counselor. Um, we're forgetting also to have them. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. But you do prep them, you actually prep them for custom. They don't take custom in the main, like just what they know. And they just don't go in cold. But I, I created a website where I put the CASA's uh, practice up there so they get Chromebooks. And you know, we're ascertaining if they even know how to turn on a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. And then we're teaching, if they don't, we're teaching them how. There are other students in the, the class that help. They're more than happy to help the, the ones that don't know. And uh, they're going in through that, you know, that link in the website to practice CASAS uh, questions. And then a, a few days later, after they've had some, you know, some practice on there, then they actually take the test. And we do all the testing. Yeah. E testing. Yeah. And so do yeah. they take this? Like, do you have the class every two weeks continually? And yeah. then they just yeah, they have open enrollment? A two week right. cohort. And so that class finishes, they get enrolled. Then the next two weeks, so you have, have open enrollment. Yeah. Yeah. And they register, they come into the office. And, and what we did is we moved, we put the intro class at our main campus where our other CTE programs are and academics are, so it's out of just the ESL only campus, so that they're familiar with what else other options are available to them. So they come in, they do the two week class, and, uh, and they register at the end of the class then? Yeah, it's part of that, like the last day of class, we do just kind of that registration into whatever option you're doing. But they initially register in the ESL office, they'll come in, a lot of registration form. We help them select an intro class to start based on when they're available to do it. Interesting. And when we finish, that the way I did it is it was like their ticket, their ticket to you know enroll in the class. And so yeah, it's just it usually done on the last day of class. They're enrolled in the class. Just a dedication to the program. Yeah, yeah. And then their dedication to the program, their motivation. Yeah. What's Mr. Jensen? Gross Bond Adult. What is it? Gross Bond Adult. He's San Diego County. That's Everybody. really interesting that you asked that. The, so they enroll, they enroll 
uh, and they take classes after the orientation class. So has, has that improved your attrition rates by any chance, by any measurable? Well, they take, they, they take it as a part of that orientation. Uh -huh. That CASAS is, that's really the heart and center of that orientation. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's part of that intro class. Yeah, it's so different they're writing basis. Different classes that they write, and then mm -hmm. writing. Like, just to give teachers a sample so that so you don't teach the writing, you just give them the content. Um, right. The, yeah, there's there's a new teacher now that she's like, can I do some writing instruction? Like, yeah, I mean, if you again, it's just one of those evolving things. Right. The teachers were kind of asking for. We can see their CASA scores, but sometimes the writing is, you know, that last component. Yeah. So it just kind of helps teachers, and it, and it helps when we're getting the intro teacher helps place them, you know, talk to the student about what class they want to enroll in. All those assessments are used to kind of help draw them. You can have like a list of all that you do in that intro class because I'd like to get them. You could email me. I don't think she has an email. I don't. No. Um. Thanks to everybody online too. Thank you.